Welcome to the Father's Heart with Tom Clark, better known as Papa Tom. Good morning, this is Tom Clark with the Father's Heart Talk Show. And I have with me again our, our show, Stu Epperson Jr. from the Truth Network. And boy, do we need some truth. We always need some truth. And it's such a beauty about truthful things that truthful things overcomes fear. And that's one of the subjects we're going to be talking about today with Stu uh, and what's happening in America and what's going on. And um, all the news media that we come across seems to be pounding us, uh, the citizens of the United States of America, with fear. And they're trying to make us fearful and fearful and trying to have it give, us, uh, give up our freedoms for security which is not going to happen, which we don't get security. And as a result of the fear, we just keep, continue to give it more and more freedoms. The most important freedom, I think, that we have in America is the freedom of speech. And so this is why the Truth Network exists. This is why I'm doing this show. Uh, remember, our mission statement is bringing the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, possessive case, lest they smite the land with a curse, and the curse is already upon us. It's the curse of fatherlessness. That's all going to change. It's going to change before the end of this year, and I think some big things are going to be happening in September of this year. Just a few days from now, it's really going to change. It's going to change big. And it's not going to be the agency of man that's going to change it. God's, our Father, is going to do something. He's going to do something really big and really powerful to uh, wipe out this evil that's been upon our nation uh, for the last 50 years and culminating it gets worse and worse. People ask, can you get any worse? Well, maybe it can't get any worse, but it seems to be terrible as it is right now. And uh, part of that terribleness of evil uh, combating good is to try to shut us up, to censor us, and to take away our freedom of speech. So, uh, Stu, why don't I turn the thought over to you, and you could speak into that uh, thought process. Well, the beauty of America, it was founded on the axiomatic bedrock foundation of freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. The founders were, you know, if you look at the history, the, our founders were, they, were they, were, they weren't all, you know, obviously perfect men. There were some challenges. They weren't all theologically spot on. But they recognized that the a free society flourishes when you allow for people of different faiths and people of different beliefs, you know, so the Trinitarians at one point said, Hey, let's, you know, the, do we persecute the Unitarians and, and put them on stakes and burn them? No, let them come on in. Let's have good rigorous discussion. Let's disagree, but they can have their houses of worship. We can have our houses of worship. What about the Mohammedans, which is what they, what, what, how they refer to the Islams, the, the Muslims. Same thing. Hey, let them come on in. This is a free society. Never, ever has this country ever discriminated against anyone. And there have been challenges, and they have the, the racial challenges. You have the slavery, and you have the segregation era, and the Jim Crow laws, and all that. Sure. But things racially have gotten so much better. We have a we have a, a, a African-American man who's one of the most powerful judges in the land, United States, Justice Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, Thomas yeah. but people... Sadly, on the left, hate his guts. Like, they should be excited that a minority has risen to such power and such success. We have uh, athletes, African-American athletes, making hundreds of millions of dollars. We have a, a – this is a free society. So there's a, a racial, there's an ethnic, there's a liberty among religions that is really what makes this country so great. And at the heart of that is this freedom of expression and keeping the government, the, the, the whole idea of religious liberty is not to keep, it's never been to keep the church out of government, is to keep the government out of church. Right, that's true. Quit defining what gender is, government. Quit defining what marriage is, government. Quit telling us what we can and cannot say. And, um, whenever and quit, the tell, quit tell us what we have to say. Well, we have to say exactly like when the government encroaches or crosses those bounds, it's always chaos, chaos, anarchy, and it's a blatant attack. And the very foundation of this country, that religious liberty, 
is eroded. And right now it's eroding because we have we have worldviews. Our country was not founded on Marxist worldview. Marxism is a autocratic, evil worldview. Socialism, communism, they're all evil. They're all drip. They're all basically at the root of them are atheism. Karl Marx was a profane profane evil man satanist he was a satanist he had kids yeah yeah he, 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 he had kids that committed suicide he was estranged he lived a horrible life he hated the 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 big guy so what does he do you know marxism which is which is basically the the view the belief of the current leadership president obama is is is, is a huge fan of all the people that have that have pushed marxism from hugo chavez who destroyed single-handedly destroyed venezuela the fourth wealthiest country in the world 25 years ago is now uh Fifty uh, percent or so of those people in Venezuela are below the poverty level. Kids will die on the streets today of starvation because Barack Obama's buddy, his hero Hugo Chavez, destroyed that country. Fidel Castro, Cuba, horrible oppression. The Cuban people are brilliant; they're enterprising, but they found themselves, as did the Albanians and the Romanians and the Russians and all the Eastern Bloc, <clears throat> the communists destroy people. They kill people. Mm-hmm. Then people say, "Well, more religion." People die from religion. Well, you know what? Yeah, there's these crusades. Yeah, there were these religious wars. But far more people were brutally murdered by Stalin, atheism, communism, by Mao in China. Tens of millions of people executed by him in the name of of red communism, Mm -hmm. by Hitler in the name of Nazism, driven by atheism, driven by these, these autocratic totalitarian views that don't let people decide for themselves. We can think better for you. Mm -hmm. How dare you? Hitler rewarded children for ratting out their parents. If the parents sitting around the table at night saying, hey, we don't think we should gas Jews. We don't think we should have this supremacy, this Darwinian racism that says the the survival of the fittest. We don't think the Jews are inferior to us. The kids would go to their teacher at school the next day and Mm -hmm. be rewarded financially for ratting their parents out. And as their parents are being dragged off in handcuffs to the gas chambers, to the gulags, to be hung or whatever, to be executed, the kids are like, oh, no more whippings. And then they're like, wait a second. We kind of miss mom and dad. We kind of miss a disciplinarian in the home. We've lost our moorings. And that's how Hitler really came to power. He went into the churches. If you know, if you, there are pictures, a great book, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who you should have on your show. I'll give you his information. He wrote a book called the cross and the swastika and he and he has pictures in germany of churches that have a cross and a swastika right next to each other mm-hmm. and bonhoeffer didn't buy it and he was hung by by the neck for for standing against the evils of hitler but many pastors caved many pastors succumbed to this you know what did hitler do he recruited the churches you know just like the socialist parties of america they go into these churches they say, oh, and the church has given up on the church. Doesn't know it. They're they're they've compromised on marriage. They've compromised on all these transgender issues. Yeah. They, you know, they're they're believing the state instead of believing the Bible. Right. And it's, it's a brilliant tactic. It works. And by the way, the 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 administration or the current regime in our country, very racist. Sadly, pro communist, pro socialist. And the reason that they're pushing, the reason President Obama in his sweet, nice, uh, aging uh, gentleman who who claims to be president, guy, the reason that they are pushing hard transgender and doing surgical attacks on these little five-year-old kids who grab a crayon that's pink instead of blue in the schools, the reason they're pushing that agenda is because that's how you bring in the Marxism and the great socialist revolution is you erode any kind of value system. We'll be back in a moment. Defined by God. We'll be back in a moment with Stu Epperson Jr.
We have with us Stu Epperson, Jr. from the Truth Network, and we were just talking about government and Marxism and communism and all these different things. I think we owe it to our audience to first step back and discuss a little bit about what government was supposed to exist for to begin with. And I really got this information from a Dr. Frank Turek, uh, who's got the book Correct, Not Politically Correct. And he discusses the whole purpose of government is to protect innocent people from evil. That's exactly right. Innocent people from evil. And we are seeing in our country, and Stuart's going to introduce a friend of his from Canada, he's going to discuss about the Canadian situation in a moment. But whether it's Canada or whether it's the United States or Venezuela or any nation in this world, that has any kind of government, the whole purpose of that government to be a legitimate, or I should say a righteous government, being in the right position in the right place, is to protect innocent people from evil. And we're finding in our own government, which is going to change shortly, Get stay with us, don't be afraid, everything's going to be shaken here, but in September we believe it's going to change, I'll bring that up later, but at this point in time we want to discuss how uh, our government has become literally evil. It has become evil because instead of protecting the people, it's taking away people's freedoms, particularly the freedom of speech. So we want to bring contextualize what um, Stu had mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. I want you to summarize that point, Stu, and we'll move on to your Canadian friend. Yeah, f- fundamentally, yeah, thank you, thank you, Papa Tom. And I kind of sorry for the rant I went on. I, I, I get passionate, especially when I see people that are like following the Pied Piper, you know, right off the cliff. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to introduce you to my friend, Sean, here from Canada in just a second. But, but what is in a synopsis of all of this is the bigger the government, the worse off we are because they want to make decisions for you. They want to tell you what marriage is. You want to marry your mom? Go right ahead. The United Methodist Church is basically going to have to let people marry their mom. Well, you love your mom. Why not? You want to marry your dog? Well, the dog is a is man's best friend. Literally, we used to laugh at this stuff, but that's what they believe. Mm-hmm. And that's you. How dare you say no? How dare you use that hate speech? HR fifty five, which has been a little bit on hold, thank God, from the Senate, is basically says that that if you say, if you if you we call it misgendering now, but if you tell someone that homosexuality is a sin, you can say it in the most loving way possible. You can say, hey. There's former homosexuals that have been saved, that God can work through that, and God can change someone's heart. He saved a wretch like me. All sins are equal. You know, you can say all that stuff, but if you dare say something's a sin and someone needs a savior, you will be tagged with a felony, and you will go to prison. And there's pastors that you – you will, if you don't marry a man and his brother or a man and his daughter, Stu, come on. Yeah, if you don't perform that marriage, those nuptials, you will go to prison. That's where, exactly where – President Obama, President Biden, they want to take us. Biden goes out because of the things. Well, Harris wants to take us there worse because they believe that government is the solution. In their world, in their construct, government is God. So the bigger the government is, the more the government tells you how to parent or how not to parent or get, gets more control. The solution Because they don't believe in the God Almighty who gave our founders the wisdom to put together a thing called the Constitution that gives us freedom of speech freedom of religion, freedom to go here and go there. Instead, they believe that they got to tax us more, that they can do better with your money than you can, which that's a joke. If, if, if your business, if the radio station, if WSIC ran their station, like our government runs the country, they'd be bankrupt tomorrow. Okay. If this coffee shop ran their, 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 thank you there, there, I just got my order here, my big smoothie. Thank you, Baller Nation. If this coffee shop ran their coffee shop like our government, so it's like, well, then why does the government want more of their money? The government should be giving us more money, giving us more incentives. The capitalism is a beautiful thing. Yeah, there's crony capitalists, but at least the idea is give the people the power to compete, the free markets. So this is all, by the way, very biblical, the right to own property. That's why there's that, that little thing called the uh, seventh or the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Because you have property. It's given to you not by the government, but by God. And you'll notice every Marxist regime, socialist and communist regime, they want to take away your property because they know how to do it better than you. They want to take away your business and tell you how to run your business, tell you who to hire, who not to hire. And they don't hire on competency, hire on these other nonsensical things. And they want to take away your money and your 
property rights and they want to take away your guns because like they can defend you better than you can. That's the second this amendment. Is how right. it goes. And by the way, the church gets quiet. Oh, those are political issues. I think murdering a little child in his mother's womb, that is a moral absolute evil. Mm-hmm. And it's time we spoke up. And preacher, it's time that you get you 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 you, you get some boldness. And you stand up for what's right. I'm not saying go Democrat or Republic from the pulpit, but I'm saying preach against the sin and challenge people to be in a culture of life and preach the gospel, which is the true heart solution. But what happened in Canada about 30 years ago, the Canadians got together, the church in Canada got together, and they said, you know what? We're going to stay in the church. We're not going to speak to these cultural social issues. Mm -hmm. Sexuality, prayer in schools, the Ten Commandments. We're not going to speak to marriage. Let the state be the state. We'll be the church. Now, there are pastors in Canada going to jail for that decision. Mm-hmm. And now, they they instead of saying, you know what, instead of how our founders intended it, the earth is the Lord's. Everything is the Lord's. How you vote is is a kingdom decision, right? Like, it's not either or, but it's I'm going to live, I'm going to vote, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be involved with public policy in a redeeming way as a witness. But I'm not going to put on, I'm not going to, Trust in that as my Lord and my God, and many believers have gone too far in that, and that's wrong. Mm-hmm. But we're going to engage and we're going to redeem even politics. Well, the Canadians bowed out about 20, 30 years ago. Tell them the price they're paying now for it, Sean. To introduce, introduce, give me your whole name. He's got a fabulous French name. I love hearing him say it. Go ahead. Sean Goddard, West Star. I'm uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, home, folks. And that's where we have a major naval base. There's a joy to serve there at a high school. Um, Canada is a country that that pretty much just loves liberty of conscience. But as Canadians, one of the hallowed sacred things we've always held dear is free health care. So whoever kind of controls the purse strings to health care controls an awful lot of how society views things. Access universally to a physician is probably one of the fundamental rights, just like liberty of conscience here in America is very, very valued or was. Um, having that ability to be able to see a physician. That was a freedom that Canadians count as valuable as hockey games and uh, Tim Horton's coffee. Mm -hmm. Things are changing, folks. Just like in America, where the Dominion voting machines have played a major role in how America votes and how those votes are tallied and accounted for, that test phase was done in Canada. And it's been very interesting to see that the current fellow, Mr. Trudeau, uh, his father was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, had the privilege of uh, spending some time with him as a young man um, and concluded that his views ideologically and politically were those of Mussolini's fascism. And they shared those views and as a family, and we see that being played out now. And there seems to be a real propensity towards a change from the Judeo-Christians from sea to sea, now changing into government knows best. Government pays the bills. Government supplies the free health care. Government provides all that you need if you're out of work. Um, all these different benefits that Canadians have have received have has impacted what liberties now we're facing. Well, it's so you see, Papa Tom, the 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 shift in Canada, and it's interesting. Metaxas could have written a letter to the Canadian Church. You know, he wrote this book called A Letter to the American church to say, hey, wake up, hey, speak up, stand up. And the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ, always. That's absolutely the truth. And the the left puts too much faith in government, like all their faith in government. The government knows best, and and it's it's an autocratic, fascist, Marxist, socialist, communist, really lie sadly because all of those systems always end up corrupt but the right on the right side a lot of believers put too much faith in government and they think to quote cal thomas he said once in a book he says jesus christ is not going to return on air force one you know so so it's so what we what we do is we recognize that god is god he is in charge and right now he's judging our country by giving us wicked rulers. That's what's happened. And by by this kind of stupefying uh, coma that the American church is in, 
not speak in church, the Canadian but, church. Yeah. But, but when we talk about <clears throat> pastors going to jail, Papa Tom, listen, our conduct as believers is critical to our neighbors. We need to be the living Jesus that people are seeing. Yep. There is a love, but there's also an ability to articulate the gospel message by our behaviors. And that's through the fruit of his Holy Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness. That's what shines forth. It's not the political rhetoric and pounding on a pulpit and being dragged out by police officers. If you're a pastor, you need to have a shepherd's heart where you're sharing the love of Jesus in a practical way. Whereas if you're being oppressed for your liberty of conscience or your views, that you're sharing the gospel, you're putting that forward. Not that you personally have a position ideologically or politically, rather one that is raising up the name of Jesus yeah. and hold. hold Help. Yeah, we can't control that the United Methodist Church has left the faith. They're no longer a church. They're a national institution. They're no longer a church because they deny Almighty God's view of man, woman, marriage, and Scripture. <laughs> but how did they get there? They stopped teaching the deep things of God's Word. Somewhere between when Wesley went off the scene and today, they they gave way and they allowed all this feminism and this, this higher criticism and all this social justice and social gospel, I secular think, unism, to invade I, their ranks. And so what we can do is we can challenge our pastors who believe the Word of God to teach their people the Word of God. And if you give people the foundation of the Word of God, 60, they'll, under, they'll get it right on marriage these other key days. I think I have an idea how the Methodist Church and how 15 other denominations ended up getting watered down into this liberal Christianity, which is not Christianity at all. And that's by the almighty dollar, that they call it. Yeah. It was funded by Rothschilds and people uh, and uh, Rockefellers and these different uh, ruling families that rule the country and rule the nations. They were smart enough to know how to get into the theological seminaries and, yeah. and provide funding for what they wanted promoted. And this is happening for the last 100 years, 80 years, 50 yeah. years it got worse, 30 years it's been worse. You know, and uh, the 30? Eric Bonhoeffer's um, or I should say Eric Matassas' book about Eric Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. There is a cost to being a disciple, and we've kind of lost sight of that. And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes, and we'll be able to uh, continue our conversation with Sean from Canada and with Stu Epperson, Jr. We'll take a break here. We are back with Stu Everson Jr. and his friend Sean from Canada, who's got some insights that he'd like to share about one of the things that God is doing. I know uh, I've been listening to a lot of prophetic words, and they've been really talking about June, July, and August being a time period of preparation for some great shaking that's going to happen uh, in September in the United States. 
And I believe the same thing applies to Canada. There'll be a great shaking in that nation as well, the rippling effect. And the purpose of the shaking is to shake all the things that are evil uh, in, our, in our, both of our countries and the tearing down of what is evil so that that which is unshakable, which is the kingdom of God, will remain standing. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Sean and ask him his insights about what God is doing on the positive side, because we hear a lot of ne- things that are, that are happening that are negative, they're depressing, or they're, they're fear-mongering or fear-provoking, I should say, and people do need some hope. I think the best hope that we have for life, Papa Tom, is the Lord Jesus and to raise up his name. And when I hear things like on Vancouver Island last week, there was something called Joy Fest, where Christian artists and Christian pastors and speakers came together in the community and shared music and shared the good news and presented an alternate vision for society trying to redefine what the family unit is and for society to come down hard on uh, folks that disagree all of a sudden. It's, it's pretty much the tolerance has shifted. It used to be the Christians are the ones that tolerated so much. And now it's almost like the Christians are being painted as the ones that are intolerant. We're very tolerant as believers in Jesus of people's views and where they're coming from. We recognize that we are without Christ lost and all of us are most hopeless. Like it's a hopeless situation. But there's Calvary, and there's the hope of hearing the good news of what Jesus did. He came by a virgin. He came all God, all man. He lived a sinless life. He performed miracles that are absolutely unparalleled in history to prove that he was who he said he was. And then he went to Calvary. But he didn't stay on on Calvary's tree after paying for your sin and mine. He rose from the dead, and his glorious good news is, as he reached out to God, his message to the disciples and to many before he ascended back to heaven was, there is hope, and it's in what he has done for us, Palpatine. That's really good. You know, uh, in my conversation with a lot of my children, I have six kids and 15 grandchildren, and a lot of the conversations I have with them have to do with the issue of fear. Mm-hmm. And I've come to the conclusion in my life that the mother of all fears is the fear of death. And we know from Scripture that when the Lord returns, he overcomes the grave and he overcomes death. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? And so all the instruments that evil tries to pound on us to cause us fear in a thousand of different flavors and varieties that fear comes from, it's all based upon the fear of death. And if you come to the place in your life where you no longer fear death, then you're not going to fear anything. And really what it comes to is you don't fear death, you're not going to fear anything. Well, how do you come to that place where you don't fear death? And the only place you can come, as we know as Scripture says, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. He's the way. Where is he the way to? He's the way to the Father. He takes us to the Father. He brings us by what he did for us and us believing in him. He brings us to the Father. And it says in the Father, we will find perfect love cast out all fear. So that's the place we don't have to fear death because perfect love casts out all fear and we understand and experience the love that God the Father has for us. And that's where when we see everything shaking all around us, which again I say, I repeat, that I believe is going to happen very soon, that we ha- there's no reason for us to be afraid of it because we are, we are covered, uh, captured, protected, uh, atone for, uh, come under El Shaddai, the, the big-breasted one. Come under the protection of God the Father. And none of that stuff should we need to worry about because it doesn't touch us because of who we are in him. So that's the word of encouragement. And when we see that it being expressed, that's where I'm trying to get to, is that uh, are there instances in Canada where you can see activities that are being expressed or uh, people having experiences that are uh, overcome, that they're not being shaken by the things that are happening uh, by the government and, and uh, perpetrating upon them this fear to try to take away their freedom. <clears throat> I think a lot of folks today, Tom, don't realize Scripture teaches there are two deaths. It's not the first death, I fear. Mm-hmm. Because when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when he is your all in all, 
when you recognize that Calvary is the work that was done so that you can rest assured that he paid the ultimate price for sin, that it's the second death that I fear for those that don't know Christ. See, we're all going to pass through this portal shortly. We're only given 70 years, so you might get 80, 90. If you're really fortunate, 100. I'm past the 70 year mark. <laughs> yeah, I'm all borrowed. But I think it's the second death I fear. I mean, two nights ago, I was talking with a friend of mine that was at Joy Fest on Vancouver Island, and we were talking about the number of friends that we have that, that have not come to Christ, that don't have the hope. And Allison and I are realtors here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we hear all the time our customers fearful of the interest rates, fearful of the market, fearful of buying a home, fearful of selling a home, all the different fears of missing out. And yet, when you look at the bigger picture, when you look at life generally, you're, all those fears are tiny temporal fears. The big one that we fear is that those that we know that d have not come to a realization yet in what Christ's work on Calvary is all about, that's what I fear is because they're going to stand before a holy God one day who's going to ask them why he should let them into his heaven. And unless Jesus says they're mine, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, they're mine and the, he's our advocate, there is no hope for them. And so that's what terrifies me. That's the fear of missing out. That's the fear of, am I living a life walking in a manner that regardless if I'm in Canada or the States where we see liberty of conscience being challenged every day, we're hearing in a relative society where relativism is reigning, it's your truth is fine as long as it doesn't hurt me, um, rather than there is foundational truth. Back to your point about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Mm -hmm. That's a claim of exclusivity, and that is viewed now as intolerant. Mm -hmm. Isn't that perplexing, Tom? Yes, well, of course, because if, if the twisting of words is what enemy uses, again, to cause fear, he wants to redefine everything. He <laughs> wants to redefine a man, redefine a woman, you know, with their speaking pronouns, or whatever it is. Whatever that they are trying to do, it's always a twisting of the words. Why is that, that they're twisting of words? Because the most powerful member of our body is our tongue. Mm. And what we speak with our tongue is words. And the most powerful thing we can speak with our words is the truth from the word itself. The scripture, as you know, says, angels hearken to the spoken word of God. We need to speak God's word because the word is what is true. And the enemy is trying to twist our speaking, our language, to speak things that are not true. Yeah, Papa Tom, but when you've got kids that are being taught from the very inception of being in school that they came from a blob of glue, their lives are insignificant, they mean nothing, mm -hmm. and when all of this lack of hopelessness that COVID and other really concerning societal matters have weighed in on this last handful of years, sure. our kids are desperate for hope. Mm -hmm. I went in to see my uh, one of my nephews graduate from high school here back in June. And I walked into a high school in Victoria where the pride flag is being painted on the front doorstep. I walked around it and the policeman that was standing there kind of raised his eyebrows. And I said, you know, I served this country in the military. Why isn't that a Canadian flag rather than a pride flag? Why is that being heralded as the be all end all for, for, for society's benefit right now? Mm -hmm. Things are changing. Right. Things are changing quickly. You know, you didn't pick this up from Stu earlier, but I, uh, God has encouraged me in the last two years to begin to write children's books. Mm. And I write children's books, Papa Tom's Tales, A Grandfather's Bedtime Stories. And love each, it. each one of the book deals with a fear and how the love of God overcome, helps him overcome the fear. And the protagonist in all my books is Luke, who's my oldest grandson's name, and it means light bearer. And Luke goes to story by story, and the first story is the boy who found his name because it's about identity. You don't know who you are. You can't deal with life, basically. You don't start starting point. And there's only one way you can know who you are, and that's from God the Father. Amen. And so it's a question of you have to understand that, A, God exists. That's fundamental. It comes from Hebrews, that we must believe that God exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Well, if you don't <laughs> even believe he exists to begin with, then you're not going to seek him, and you will find out who you are. Just go out of your just go out on your porch tonight and look up at the stars. The handiwork. It, it, did that happen by chance? No, it's by design. It's intelligent design. The same one that created us and built us in His image. 
That's great hope. That's true. The second book is about uh, overcoming the spirit of confusion because it really deals with gender dysphoria. And it's a boy whose father called him Sue. And he called him Sue because a whole bunch of storyline has to do with a background to that. But really what it came down to is that the father was deceived and he misnamed him. And he goes up there. Is that the Johnny Cash tale, Papa Tom, that gave you that? <laughs> I, have, I kind of fit in there. A boy named Sue. But the, the it turns out his name becomes Samuel, which ap- happens to be the male equivalent of Sue, Susan. Susan's the feminine. Samuel is the male uh, side of that. And uh, the whole purpose of it is that um, the enemy tried to confuse his father, the boy's father, and because he loved his grandmother and and he wanted, to, he wanted to have a girl. And when he had a boy, he still named the, the boy a girl's name because of the confusion the father was in. And God explains the whole thing in the book number two and straightens the whole story out why that all happened. But the point is that the spirit of confusion is all over our children. The yes. enemy is coming after our children. 90 seconds. And he's trying to confuse them into... Uh, First of all, not understanding who they are to begin with, but then secondarily, try to confuse them over their gender. You know, God creates a man and a woman. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't make a mistake. And the confusion over that is that we can somehow change our biology by changing our mindset. You can't. It's objectively true that you're either a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. You can't 60? change your, your, your uh, <clears throat> biological sex or your gender, and even if you change your body, it still doesn't change your gender. It's impossible to change your gender. And, and Papa Tom, even thinking that you can is a confusion. Let's encourage parents to get back to the dinner table with their kids. Let's have these discussions with our children at home. That's true. Let's, That's good. Let them ask those hard questions, and let's have those hard discussions. And if you don't know where to get the answers, reach out to your local pastors and talk to them about how to equip them with what you're saying is how to overcome this confusion. I really encourage fathers to read Papa Tom's Tales to their children. And it's, it's mothers by the books, but fathers read them. The whole relationship they have going forward will be different, and I'll introduce them to a relationship with God as their father. We'll be back in another, another few minutes.
Well, we're back with Stu Epperson Jr. and we were talking about the issue of why should we not be afraid, Stu? What is it that God's doing and that we could see glimpses of that the mainstream media will not show us, share with us about why people should be encouraged and have hope in what God's doing and what he will be doing very shortly in America and in Canada and throughout the world? I think your opening of your program and your passion, kind of your mantra monicum of Malachi, the last verse in the Old Testament, where he says, you know, the, the, the turning the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children. Uh, Papa Tom, I was going to ask you to ask me what my favorite of the Ten Commandments, which one's my favorite? Would, I know what it is. I know what it is before I ask. But I, I'll guess it's, it's the fourth one. On your father well, and mother. Yeah, the fifth commandment. Now, this is very interesting about that. And, I, and I, I did a deep dive on that. And I'll tell you exactly why this one is my absolute favorite. And because every of the commandments, all ten of them, would die, would be obsolete if it weren't for the fifth commandment. Mm -hmm. Because we always say this. Honor your father and mother, that commandment. We always say it's the only commandment with a promise, right? Right. So it'll go well with you in your life. Yeah. What is the promise? Well, the, the promise in Exodus chapter 20 mm -hmm. is that you will have long life on the earth. Mm -hmm. But the Deuteronomy chapter 5 promise, which is basically an expansion of and an explanation of the Exodus 20 command, mm -hmm. says that you, that, you're, that you may live well. So there's not just a quantity of life connected quality. with honor, father and mother, but there is a quality of life, living well. Paul, fast forward to Ephesians chapter 6, he quotes this commandment. He's, he calls it the only commandment with a promise. Now, why is that the only commandment with a promise? I'll tell you why. Because, you ready for this? Yeah. It's big. Well, because this commandment is the only commandment that has legs on it. What do you mean by legs? Who, who else is going to take the message of no other God, no graven image? Don't take the Lord. Don't profane God's name in your life and in your lips. Take a Sabbath day for Pete's sake. God gave you a day to take a break. Turn the phone off. Hang with the family. Relax. Recalibrate. Refresh. Honor your father and mother. Don't commit adultery. Don't lie, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and don't covet. The only command that gives legs to all those is the fifth commandment. Because if I don't teach that to my children, Papa Tom, mm -hmm. then guess what? They're it not going to teach that to their children. And they're going to go in the land, they're going to be derelict, and they're going to die off. And the, the generational blessing of the message of a loving God who came to save wretched sinners like you and me is going to be gone and obsolete. And so this is what God was doing with these Ten Commandments. He was not just preparing a land for his people, the promised land, Cana land, Beulah land. He was preparing a people for a land. And that people was his people, the children of Israel. And he was preparing them. And in the home, this is these are God's ordained institutions on earth. Ready? Mm -hmm. What are they? They are the family, right? A mom and a dad. You know, well, Stuart, other. you think about it. Stop for a for one second. Think about it. You know, it says honor your father and mother, so it'll go well with you in your life. There's there's one thing your father and mother absolutely had to do for you to be here, and that's that they had to have children. And if you go back to the first mandate that God gave Adam and Eve, he said, the man and the woman, he said, be fruitful and multiply. So if a man and a woman did not were not fruitful and multiplied, they wouldn't have any children, and you wouldn't have to worry about the uh, fourth, the commandment of honor your father that's and mother. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, so it all, it's all, if you don't progenate, and that's, by, by the way, the problem with these, these diabolical, deviant sensuality, that's why Satan is right behind all these, these sexual deviancies and trans deviancies. He's behind all that. Why? Because he does not want there to be a progenization or a multiplication of mankind. Right. He's all about death. That's why he's commanding these abortion clinics, mm -hmm. left and right. That's why he is 
he's the he's the father of lies and he is the the father of death. The thief comes to do what? To steal, kill and destroy. To kill mm -hmm. and to destroy. And so he wants to cut it right off there at the womb and of course euthanasia at the tomb before we can even bury our old. He wants to kill him in that, right? In assisted right. suicide. Dr. Gavorkian, man, that he's G-rated compared to what's happening right now. Yeah. So you think about this. You think about this. This command is so important, Papa Tom. There's a there, this is the good news, by the way. This Christian movies are going crazy good. You like you have you may have had Cornelius on your show, Cornelius Mueller on your yes. show, who's writing this 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 great movie coming out in a couple of weeks, making him famous. Right. Is there a better title to a better movie, right? Right. You have the Jesus Revolution, where this revival broke out in the hippies, and they realized what was the my favorite quote for that movie. Hey, all of a sudden. Hippies are getting saved. And one of the guys said, I had no idea that a hippie could get saved. Right. You know, if God can save a hippie, he can save a, a, you know, a wretch like me. You have the Jesus Revolution. You have all these Christian movies going crazy. And, Mel Gibson's going to come out with another one, too, here in a, in a few months. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, hey, how about Sound of Freedom outperforming Indiana Jones and Mission Impossible and all these big, big ticket, big yeah. actor movies, Sound of Freedom exposing this evil, sedacious, evil, horrible, deviant human trafficking where we're trafficking our children. Right. We murder our young in America, and we traffic our young. And, and, and it's fed by all the pornography industry. It's fed by all this stuff. And it's fed by these politicians who are on, all, on a, all on a list that will never come to surface because they're all running the country. And, they, you know, you know this, this uh, hillbilly dude wrote a song and saying it, it's all over YouTube now. Uh, Oliver or something, I think is his name. And he talked about, hey, they're, you know, our politicians are interested in minors when they're on an island. Okay, so this this whole thing, CNN's not talking about that, but it's very real. The abuse and the horrible things happening to our little children. So this command to honor your father and mother, that you will live long and you'll be blessed, is this is the point of this command. Ready? And this is the hard part. Because I'm easy, and I said this on your show a month ago when I was, a, I was honored to be a guest. It's easy for me to go look at all these evil people riding in the streets, blowing up buildings, breaking into Nordstrom, stealing whatever they want, whatever. And this evil government that allows it, that just is, is fully corrupt. I Promotion. mean, just blatantly evil. I can say them, them, them. But I got four daughters. I got a son-in-law. I got a grandson. I got a grandson or two being born in the next 24 hours down in Jacksonville. They're trying to wait out this storm and have a baby at the same time. And I'm going to tell you, I got a big duty to pour, to not just, it's not just children honoring mom and dad. It's parents being honorable moms and dads. Mm -hmm. I need to pour in love on my kids, pour Christ in them so much, equip them, empower them so that they will go out. The answer to the reason that this is the most powerful commandment is in modern warfare. And I'm telling you, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book about this. David and Goliath, when they invented the arrow, they invented a weapon that suddenly changed all of warfare, right? Because, you know, no longer was just arm to arm, hand to hand, spear and sword and clash, right? In, in the rubble and in the, in the battle, right? But this arrow could hit someone from 100 yards away, 50 yards away, 25 yards away. And Psalm 126, Psalm 127 talks about having a quiver full of, of children. And we've got to realize we are parents so we can weaponize our children to go out there and change the whole world. I don't have kids. Then you go and make disciples, a la Matthew 28, Christ's famous final powerful words before he ascended into heaven. And you go may have spiritual progeny. Who are you discipling? Who's discipling you? Are you in a church that preaches the gospel? That is a di The church is to be a discipleship factory. You older men need to take younger men and pour Christ into them and send them out. My dad, we buried him just over a month ago powerful message hundreds of people came to the service and hundreds and now all kinds of more people I even even know said that man poured into me and now i'm a man of god one guy came he says man i was a thuggish ruffian druggy beating people up and big Stu picked me up and loved me i was sitting there on the on the porch of the church he grabbed me he said come in here and sit between me and nancy and he and i called i didn't know what to call him so i called him uncle Stu and aunt nancy this guy was rough this guy had no dad. His dad checked out a long time ago. His name's Jacob. Jacob now is writing a book. He's pastored churches. He loves Jesus. He's raising a godly seed to send out in the world to change the world. 
And so that's the impact that my dad had. Sure. I'm standing here talking on this big radio show with you because my dad loved me and poured Christ into me. He taught me the Bible when I was a wee lad. Mom poured the scriptures into me. So the question is, how am I multiplying? Right. Who am I pouring into? How am I a super spreader of truth? You know, we got all these people that are super spreaders of this, this, whatever's contrived or not. I mean, there was some problems with this pandemic, so we were more afraid and more Friends, focused on not two minutes. spreading it than we were as believers spreading the good news of Christ right. and spreading out the gospel. The gospel can change someone's life forever. Less than five percent of born again Christians have led one person to Christ in the last year. I have the cure to cancer and COVID. I have the, 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 the words of life that can set you free from any addiction and take you to heaven when you die and give you meaning while you live. Who am I telling? And this is what the fifth commandment does. The fifth commandment says, go father spiritual children, if you can't have 90. biological children, and send them out to spread the good news. You know, it's, it wasn't lost on me, because I never met your dad personally, but I heard a lot about him, that your calling and destiny, you became who you are today because of what your father did for you. And he brought out your calling and destiny. And we have to realize that all of our children are not our children. All of our children belong to God. They're God's children. 60. So what your father did for you was to bring out Stu Everson Jr. was a little kid that he realized was God's child, not Stu Everson Sr.'s child. And he, he spoke into your life all that he could to, to nurture you and to bring out what your calling and destiny is. Satan is so dead against taking all the children because he's trying to take the children's calling and destinies away from them because he knows his time is short. So he knows his time is short. He's going to stop the calling and destinies coming forth of this generation that's being born right now. So, yeah, Stu, yeah. I really thank you for being uh, participating with our show today, and we'll look Great forward to, to here, connecting man. in the future. One challenge. I may not be able to save America, but by golly, I'm going to do everything in my might to save Americans. I'm One going to at share time. the gospel with anyone I come in contact with. Pour Christ them, disciple them, and, 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 and send out them into the world and multiply ourselves. Because there's still two and a half billion people on planet Earth who've never heard the gospel. So we got to get after it. We